in foods and the previous one we were talking about the structure of different uh, fats in particular and today we're going to talk a lot more about function of fats in food systems. So at the end of this video you'll be able to define the role of lipids in a variety of different food product applications. You'll discuss how melting point range impacts on organoleptic quality of a variety of different food products and you'll define the role of fat crystallization in product functionality. And so what does this mean? If you haven't watched part one, you will want to go back to part one and uh, take a look at the structures of fats because this is going to help you understand how they function in foods. But uh, as we know, fat makes food delicious. Fat carries uh, some of the fat soluble vitamins. It provides a lot of energy and nutrition. But most of all, it's what makes food delicious. Back in the um, 1980s in particular, there was a big pushback in the food industry to make everything low fat, low fat, low fat. And one of the big uh, pieces of pushback from the general public was that food stopped tasting delicious. And our understanding of the role of fat in nutrition has really evolved over the past couple of decades. And we understand that fat is an incredibly important factor within um, the selling proposition of a food product that you have to be really strategic that the fats that you're using are of a better profile but at the same time that your product is delicious and in many cases that product deliciousness converts back to fat so let's talk about how it functions in different food products today so i'm talking about deep frying deep frying is uh incredibly important uh economically in terms of Product development. Honestly, most quick service restaurants are using some sort of deep frying. Um, a lot of convenience foods that are commonly consumed in North America are uh, deep fried. This is a, a smaller scale um, continuous deep frying unit. And you can see how a product would be battered and breaded and then dropped into a deep frying um, continuous belt. And that belt is then going to pull the product through in a time sequence so that you know exactly the time and temperature being applied to this product and it's being dropped off on a after having gone through a, a draining process and that product this this uh, this scale of equipment could be seen in a small food processor these these types of continuous deep frying systems in many cases are enormous and I've been in uh, facilities that are doing chicken fingers or french fries where these um, continuous fryers are absolutely critical to the operation. So what's going on in deep frying? Well, fat, as we, as we talked a little bit about, fat is able to tolerate temperatures that are not uh, possible in water-based systems. So boiling or braising or um, these, sorts of, these sorts of processes are limited by the... the heat capacity of water and its ability to transfer that heat. Fat just happens to be able to tolerate, in many cases, temperatures that far exceed uh, the boiling point of water. And so you can have incredibly high heat transfer. So what do we see in this diagram? Well, we've got, um, in essence, it's a schematic of a frying operation. You've dropped a piece of food there in the center, and it's going through this rapid heat transfer, both by convection, so moving oil, as well as conduction. So you've got that um, heat transfer through the solid food product. It's releasing a lot of water vapor and steam. And those of you who've operated a deep fryer, the, the students at Niagara College most certainly have operated deep fryers in their, in their culinary classes, you see a huge amount of steam vapor being released. And that rapid rapid heat transfer allows for crust formation and the starches and proteins in that product to go through what's called glass transition so you get crustiness and crunchiness that you can't get in quite the same way by doing um, baking or uh, pan frying processes in in this case you've got so much uh, heat capacity from the oil surrounding the product that the heat transfer is quite profound and you go through glass transition much more readily. 
dehydration of the product is quite capable. Um, think about making potato chips. You are not only frying and cooking off the starches, you are um, more or less fully dehydrating that, dehydrating that product. And so it is a balancing act because you go through enough heat transfer. If you haven't removed other, other residual sugars, for example, you can end up with caramelization or miller browning occurring within that product and scorching and burning the product. But uh, deep frying can be used as a dehydration process. Something that uh, this doesn't show, but there are frying units, and we were talking about this in the third year, where you seal it off and then you have a vacuum. That's a U, U, M. And you'd pull a vacuum on your frying. That vacuum frying capability is not uncommon. It's, it's, I, I've seen it more commonly in, in Asia than I have in North America. But vacuum frying is an interesting process because you're able to speed up that dehydration without requiring quite the um, exhaustive temperatures and you're getting that frying in glass transition. And this is nice for uh, the purposes of uh, making puffed snacks or dried fried fruit snacks. Um, uh, uh, go to a grocery store like TNT in the greater Toronto area and you can find uh, fried jackfruit, fried banana slices. Um, these are all vacuum fried so that you still retain some of the sweetness and that sugar doesn't go through caramelization and miller browning but the product becomes fully dehydrated it's a it's really neat the the sorts of physical chemistry that you can manipulate by modifying your frying operation let's just jump for the challenge with frying is that different smoke or different uh, different oils pardon me have different smoke points i'm looking at the slide and jumping ahead in the words in my head um different smoke points allow for different oils to achieve different temperatures. So uh, butter and uh, margarine have quite low smoke points. And a smoke point implies this is the temperature at which you start to see visible um, smoking and combustion of the oil. The amount of impurities in the oil indicates that. The amount of um, unsaturated um, Fatty acids, to a certain extent, limits the smoke point as well. Oops, pardon me. Clicking ahead here. It's important to note the smoke point on different oils. You couldn't, for example, put, let's say, hemp oil into a deep frying operation. It, it would really have a lot of problem. That said, if you were able to do a vacuum frying, you may be able to get away with things that you couldn't do because you're not pulling as high a temperature but you may not get the same uh, starch um, glass transition and that crunchiness that you'd be wanting. Um, but it's worth noting the different smoke points. This uh, higher smoke point implies better frying stability, both in open frying and in deep frying operations. So again, here's another uh, quick schematic. The challenge with frying operations is that oil is inevitably in unstable and you expose that oil to heat and it's start, it will start to oxidize and decompose. Um, you expose that oil to all sorts of impurities from the food, uh, food processing operation. Uh, if, if you've ever had to clean a deep fryer, you know just how much um, gunk, I, I was going to say, uh, all, sorts of, all sorts of different impurities are thrown off by the frying operation. And the presence of those impurities over time with... The heat and the frying operation accelerates the um, decomposition of that oil. And it is important to note that we see um, the oil start to uh, polymerize. If you've ever had to clean a deep fryer, you know that there's this almost plastic rubber. And that's actually polymerized oil. The oil decomposes. It goes through our summarization and cyclization. And it decomposes into uh, almost plastic. It is indeed a polymer. And those polymers become incredibly resistant. That's also, uh, in some cases, a positive. If you are at home and you're using cast iron, that polymerization that occurs from oil frying can be a benefit. Um, but in the case of industrial operations, that polymerization becomes a real uh, nightmare to clean up. 
And so making sure that uh, in the case of those uh, continuous fryers, there's usually some sort of continuous pumping filtration system that's pulling out impurities to retain the quality of that oil as long as possible during the frying operation. Usually frying operations will also be evaluating on a routine basis the polar compound. Um, that uh, Polar compounds, as you can guess, fatty acids are nonpolar. And as they're breaking down, the, their polarity starts to increase. And so you can see the increase of polar compounds over time from frying oil. The challenge is there's not a single pathway of um, that uh, decomposition. There are some discrete pathways, and I'll, I'll bring those up in a minute. But you'll see just the the, the sheer number of different uh, uh, hydrolysis and oxidation products and polymerization products that are occurring means that the chemical pathways are quite complex. We're going to try and just present it outright. Now, let's, uh, let's just take a moment here. The thing about deep frying is that we have to do think about the relative rate of oxidation. And we'll thank our friends at Richardson Oil, uh, um, Lori Jones, who's one of their senior food scientists, shared these slides with us in the past. And um, the challenge with deep frying operations is oftentimes food product developers immediately jump into cost and they're like, well, soybean oil is cheaper than canola oil. Let's use soybean oil, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you think about the fact that these have different rates of oxidation, um, you can do an estimate of oxidation. You can also ask your oil provider what's the relative rate of oxidation. But uh, saturated fat um, doesn't readily oxidize. Omega-6 fatty acids, so we're, we're talking about polyunsaturated fatty acids at this point, have a higher rate. They have the, 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 the most oxidation potential in uh, frying operations. So omega-6 has a relative rate of oxidation of 100, and omega-3 has a relative oxidation rate of 150. And so these are going to oxidize that much faster than our saturated fats. Monounsaturated fats have a, have a the capability of oxidizing, but it's much lower compared to our polyunsaturated. So you can do an estimate of the relative oxidation rates of these oils. And if you look here, the oxidation rate of soybean oil is, is almost twice that of canola oil when it comes to this sort of fatty acid profile. And honestly, um, working with your oil supplier, if you're, if you're just going to a place like Costco and buying bulk oil, you may not be able to get this sort of uh, information from your supplier. But if you're working with an industrial supplier, you can call them up and say, hey, can I find out about oxidative rates for deep frying operations? So in the case of soybean oil, while you may be you may be paying 18% more for canola, you have almost, uh, in terms of relative oxidation rate, you've got twice the shelf life in terms of uh, your frying operation and its relative rate of oxidation. And so it's worth having these sorts of conversations with your supplier, and it's worth having some initial trials to see uh, what's the rate of formation of polar compounds in my frying operation does it make a more expensive ingredient maybe more worthwhile in the long run? Oh, let's talk about cookies. Let's talk about the role of um, fats in baked goods and in snacking foods. And boy, I could go for a cookie right now. So let's switch topics from deep fryers to um, dough formation. So we talked about gluten formation in a previous slide or in a previous slideshow about protein. Um, let's talk about the role of fat in uh, protein formation. There's someone looking at me. <laughs> so we've got this gluten formation. So we've got uh, glutalin and gliadin, and we're forming those disulfide bonds across the proteins that makes that lovely elastic network. And that's where we get the, glu er, the gluten and the, the dough extensibility. And in many doughs, that's ideal. However, that's not ideal for everything. In some cases, we want to have a really short dough, such as in our chocolate chip cookies or biscuits or crackers. And in other cases, we want dough with um, not quite the same toughness. We want good emulsification so that we get um, really good sponge formation in our raised doughs. So think uh, 
um, traditional challah, um, which is a, a Jewish style of uh, raised dough, or brioche, where you've got a lot of butter emulsified into that dough. You've, you've got really, really wonderful uh, uh, gel formation. Um, that sponge that forms because of the emulsification is because we've shortened the f we've shortened the gluten formation. So if we're adding fat into our formulation, we're, we're blocking a lot of those disulfide bonds from forming. And as such, that allows for even uh, more extensibility of the gluten up to the point that that gluten is no longer extensible. It just snaps. And so some fat is good. And in some cases, you want no gluten formation. You want lots and lots of fat in there to prevent the gluten from forming and act as a plasticizer. In other cases, you want just enough fat so that you retain some gluten, but it becomes, it becomes really uh, smooth and extensible. So think of it that way, that the fat is coating the gluten or the, the glutalin and gliadin particles so that those disulfide bonds can't be forming and not forming nearly as fast. Now, uh, in other cases, we are using fat in laminate doughs or in laminate structures. So in many cases, cookies or crackers, um, you are trying to create these pockets of fat in the dough that allow for um, during the heating process, you get the steaming off of it and you end up with pockets of air. Uh, croissant's a really great example where that steaming creates the nice flaky texture, pastries and danishes and so on as well. And so in really good formulation and expansion, you have nice layers of your fat. And, and in this case, uh, because these slides were shared from our friends at Richardson, um, the, uh, they're, they're suggesting margarine. <laughs> they, of course, are selling margarine for the for baking applications. They don't sell butter. Um, so we've got this butter or margarine making really nice, discrete layers between the dough. If you have poor um, expansion, it could be from over-incorporation. You, uh, you could have the margarine or butter too soft so that you're collapsing it. In the case of other products such as uh, biscuits or crackers, you could be over incorporating the fat. If you're making pie crusts, over incorporation of the fat so that the particles are too small, you don't get the same flaky expansion that occurs. And so the, this illustration is just showing you've got perhaps the same uh, physical amount of margarine, but the dough has collapsed on itself and the, the steam pocketing that can occur to form those flaky uh, layers doesn't have quite the same capability. Let's switch topics here again. Thank you to our friends uh, at Richardson Oilseed and Lori Jones in particular for sharing these slides with us. Um, this one is solid fat content, and this is something that's really important to discuss with um, within your R and D team to identify what is the solid fat content at different temperature ranges. So we talked in the previous slideshow, a, a, a fat source is not one single fatty acid. It's going to have a whole mixture of different fatty acids and each of those has a different melting point. And when we're blending it all together, that's going to show uh, this sort of melting curve. And so if we, if we see down here at 10 degrees Celsius, these different shortenings have different amounts of solid fat. And so let's see, we've got this blue line here and it's shortened at uh, Z83. And we've got this green one, Covo 00685. Shorten it generic and shorten it SO44. Each of these has a different uh, amount of solid fat content. Oh, pardon me. And so these all-purpose shortenings have different fat, uh, um, solid fat content profiles. Each application that you're working on is going to work better or worse with different solid fat content profiles. So it is important to think about that and incorporate that into your experimental design if you're on the early stage of R&D or incorporate it into your troubleshooting when thinking about formulation moving forward, or if, if you're doing um, 
let's say, uh, product matching, let's say you're buying from Richardson Oilseed and you've been really, really happy with this, but we know this past year there's been a lot of supply chain issues. You may be wanting to match a melting, uh, a melting profile from a competitive supplier. Go buy from Richardson. They, they've been really kind to us. But I know in reality, honestly, there are so many times where food scientists are being asked to reformulate based off of supply chain issues or supplier issues. And matching your uh, solid fat content profile is one important aspect when switching between different uh, fat stocks. About margin, same deal. Um, Roll-in margin versus spreading or baking margin is going to have a very different profile. And so if you are selling margin, um, let's say your Unilever, and you're selling margin uh, basel for the purposes of um, spreading on toast, you would want a very different profile so that you can take it from the fridge and be able to spread it. Whereas in the case of baking margin, they want to have a... A uh, solid fat content profile that is very, very close to butter when it uh, when it comes to matching, because in many cases, uh, margarines are going to be used as substitutes for butter at a much lower price point in baked goods, in crackers, in um, pastries, and so on, to uh, reduce the cost to the consumer. And so in this case, the application... Um, is going to really indicate the, uh, the solid fat content. Roll-in shortening or margin, again, uh, take a look. If you're doing a roll-in application like uh, Danish pastries or croissants, you've got a very, very similar solid fat content across these um, comparable products. How about frying oil and shortening? So. This one's interesting because uh, liquid oil, as you know, is going to be liquid across the, uh, the, the temperature profile. Liquid fry may come in as a partly cloudy liquid, and as soon as it's heated, it, it's turning solid. And, and, and honestly, more saturated fat is going to lead to a solid, um, pardon me, more saturated fat is going to lead to a longer shelf life in that product. And so... Deep fried products usually are not, um, they don't usually have a health halo around them. People aren't over counting their calories when they're eating deep fried product. And saturated fat is going to lead to uh, a much more stable product. Now, this one's interesting though. Donut Fry It Classic. Donut fats. If, if you've ever had a donut fried in oil, you know it. Because it's incredibly oily and greasy. Whereas a donut fried in a solid fat stock, it's, it's obviously not solid when it's in the deep fryer, but if it's solid at room temperature, it gives a very different eating experience. And honestly, um, a donut fried in a uh, room temperature solid fat has less greasiness, less oiliness. Uh, you don't get that same oil stain when you have it on your napkin. And... That solid fat content also allows for better adhesion of the um, icings. You, you have a solid fat uh, crystalline structure within the icing or glazing coating, and it allows for better adhesion versus using a, a liquid oil. That liquid oil almost uh, becomes slippery, and you have very difficult uh, time having adherence of icings and glazings on that, on that donut. And so uh, using a solid fat stock for donut frying is absolutely a really important quality issue. We talked a little bit before about interesterification, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But the idea of interesterification is that you can take the fatty acids that you've got on your, in your blend and uh, you can randomize it using... Um, Enzymatic glycerolysis, and there's been some recent developments in this field. Historically, um, interesterification has been much more random, and now there's a lot more discrete work uh, that's capable. They, they will do this randomization. That What you can do with a randomized fat, or even with a native fat, you can go about fractionating it. And so you would set the fat at a very discrete temperature, and you would centrifuge off the liquid portion and save the solid stock. And you can re-blend that fat to meet the uh, 
solid fat content melting profile that you are after for your product. And so um, here's some examples of uh, native fats and then interesterified fats. So you've got a, a really uh, solid fat and a really liquid fat. And when you blend the two together and interesterify it, you have a much, much more desirable fat in terms of the solid fat content and melting profile of that product. Oh, here's another one, chocolate. Chocolate's fun because if you remember from the previous slideshow, we talked about the fact that fat polymorphism is important in terms of the texture and the structure of fats. And in the case of chocolate, chocolate is capable of expressing all of these different fat polymorphism forms. And we talked before that there are alpha polymorphisms, beta prime polymorphisms, and beta polymorphisms. And so in the case of uh, different products, beta prime has very small, fine needle crystals. Beta, uh, beta crystals are very large and coarse. And if you've ever melted cocoa butter, you, or, or not cocoa butter, coconut oil, coconut oil often has these uh, chunky beta crystals and you can actually physically see them. Alpha crystals are very fine plates and have a very, very fine texture. So we, we um, from extra crystallography, we know that there's this sort of uh, tuning fork versus uh, slanted tuning fork versus chair sort of packing of these fatty acids. Um, pardon me, triglycerides, not fatty acids. So in the case of shortening, in the case of shortening, beta shortenings tend to have larger crystals. This is interesting because it sort of contradicts the previous slide, but beta shortenings do not allow the same amount of air incorporation. So you end up with a, with a, with a gritty or waxy texture. In the case of beta prime shortenings, you end up with much smaller crystals and you get better functionality. Cocoa and, uh, Chocolate are a good example of a product that's able to exhibit all sorts of different polymorphisms. And so if you do not temper your chocolate or do not use the right temperature combinations when melting and resetting the chocolate, you can end up with the wrong polymorphic fat form. So chocolate can exhibit all of these different forms. The ideal form is form five. One is a uh, form Form 5 polymorphism is a beta polymorphism, and it's got a melting point of 34 to 35 degrees Celsius. That just happens to coincide with our body temperature, and it happens to have the best snap and crunch sort of uh, characteristics, and it's visually glossy. Um, thermodynamically, Form 6 is the form that the fat wants to revert to, and improper tempering, you can over revert that uh, to that beta prime um, form and you end up with chocolate blooming. Over time, slowly but surely, fat will bloom out and it will form this sort of white furry uh, visible aspect to the chocolate. And it's not unedible, but it's, it's visually unappealing if you were to open a pretty box of chocolates and you end up with these furry white looking chocolates. It's just that the, 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 the cocoa butter has reverted over to this uh, thermodynamically more stable beta prime form of fat. And it's, it's far more crumbly and not as ideal. There's a whole uh, school of being able to temper chocolate. I'm not going to talk about it because there's lots of resources out there, but uh, do find out more about tempering chocolate. And there's so many career opportunities in chocolate manufacture. I can't stress enough how much fun it would be to be a chocolatier or work in a in a large chocolate factory like uh, our partners down the road at Ferrero making uh, all sorts of different fun chocolate confectionery items or maybe our friends at Mondelez at Cadbury making chocolate bars for all the all the people in Canada boy I, I you know I like chocolate so it's fun to talk about and fun to think about so that's it for um, some of the functional aspects of that. I do have two more slideshows coming because we've had some questions come in. And so I look forward to following up with slideshow number three and I will see you soon.